God's grace, His mercy, His peace be with you today through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Today we're continuing our sermon series on the Beatitudes, which is also called the Sermon on the Mount because Jesus preached it on a mountain. So we've done the first four. We're looking at the fifth Beatitude today. So let's ascend those slopes again and climb up to the higher places, the recesses of the upper elevations, sit down with Jesus and feel that cool upper air as our King sits down with us to teach us about his kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. So let's pick it up then in Matthew chapter 5. We'll read just verses 1 and then we'll jump to verse 7. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain and when he sat down, his disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and taught them saying, Verse 7, the fifth beatitude. He says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So let's talk about that one today and see what Jesus means by that. What does he mean? What is he aiming to teach us about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, when he says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Let's take a look at that one. What can we say about this? I'm calling on you, Kevin. Number one. This is a blessing he is declaring to us because he starts with the word blessed, which in Greek is ah makarios. Yes, very good, which means blessed, happy, and joyful are you when you are merciful. Why is that such a blessed state? Well, you shall obtain mercy, which is really as much as to say you shall also obtain my kingdom. For my kingdom is mercy, and it is gifted to those who are merciful. So certainly this is a super great blessing, and it's awesome. Blessed are the merciful, says the Lord. But secondly, what does it mean, though, to be merciful? Can we get a little deeper into that? I know we all know what mercy means, but let's see if we can get a clearer distinction about it. The word Jesus, is, Jesus uses here is, is uh, eleo. Uh, Aleo, uh, the verb is to be merciful. It means to be compassionate, to be kind, to be benevolent toward those who are uh, about you. Ultimately, it, mean, it means to have compassion, to be kind, not to harm or to condemn, but to help and to save, even to forgive those who it is within your power to punish or destroy. So this is a key part of mercy, is that to show mercy, you've got to be in the higher, greater, more powerful position. Amen? It's not the weaker that shows mercy on the greater, but the greater that shows mercy on the weaker, more vulnerable, in distress, troubled position. Can I make that clear for you? Picture this. Your pastor, Greg, goes into a boxing ring with Mike Tyson. Would it be appropriate for me to walk up to him and say, hey, Mike, I just want to let you know, I'm going to show mercy on you today. Would that be an appropriate thing for me to say? Would it not be more appropriate, since he's a fighter, a killer, a champion, the heavyweight champion of the world at one point, for him to say, Greg, I know you don't have any training. My power is way beyond yours. I could destroy you. But I want to let you know, I'm going to be nice. I'm going to show you mercy today. Would that be more appropriate? Obviously, because he's in the greater position, he shows power on the weaker, more vulnerable one. And what would be my response? Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you for sparing me, letting me live. Oh, great, majestic, marvelous Mike. So it's the one in the greater position who has power when you could hurt somebody when you could destroy somebody, to not do that, but to choose instead to be kind, to show benevolence, to let the person go free, to lift up, to save them when you could, it's within your power, and justice could allow you and permit you to hurt, harm, destroy, not forgive them, but you let them go out of mercy's sake. That's goodness in your heart. So it's to choose kindness, to choose compassion, to pity, to help, to save, 
to lift up, even to forgive, when justice would, could permit you to destroy. That's mercy. And Jesus here in this beatitude lifts up mercy as one of the greatest of all things. And he uh, says, those who are merciful, well, you shall obtain mercy, you shall obtain my kingdom, especially when I, the king, come in my kingdom to judge the earth. When you're merciful, you shall obtain mercy from me. If you are not merciful in this life, well, you will not obtain mercy on that day. So how great and super and marvelous is mercy, amen? So the next thing is, do you think if we look out on mankind that we often see mercy at work in the world and in the history of man? I mean, if you think of it, if you look at the history of the world, if you had a history book and looked at it, it's like a long catalog of a lack of mercy. It's really man's cruelty towards his fellow man. Then came the Assyrian king against Israel, no mercy. Babylonian king, no mercy. Alexander the Great, the Greek king, no mercy. The Romans, Caesar, no mercy. Later in history, you get Napoleon, the French king, no mercy. Hitler, the German chancellor, no mercy. So there's no mercy in these upper echelons of society. A lack of mercy, rather cruelty, is the way of the world. How about, though, down on our level? You've got business people, some of them, and in the world anyway, they might claw their way to the top and run over their fellow man to destroy him without mercy, to gain the advantage and have the better uh, bank account. How about driving down the road? Sometimes you see road rage. There's no mercy there. I cut you off. I'm going to get first to my destination. No mercy. They're angry. Sometimes a man might divorce his wife or a woman her husband. And when they part, it's just bitterness, wrath, anger, a poison, and a lack of forgiving, a refusal flatly, I will not forgive you. I will hold this poison and bitterness in my heart. That's no mercy. And there's also no mercy when, if you were to pass by, say, a homeless person on the street who is in cold, in exposure, desperate, in trouble, hungry, starving, and like the Levites or these priests, you pass by on the other side. Remember? The one who showed mercy on him, the Samaritan, Jesus praises. It's the one who shows mercy on the one who is in the weaker position. And the world then really is not a place of mercy. We're living in a doggy dog world. In fact, uh, we read in Proverbs 21, the soul of the wicked desires evil, his neighbor finds no mercy in his eyes. So it's the characteristic of the cruel and wicked to not show mercy. And even the beasts, the creatures suffer under this. Proverbs 12 says, A righteous man has regard for the life of his beast, but the mercy of the wicked is cruel. Even the animals groan under the cruelty of man. It's lack of mercy. So why does Jesus then so highly exalts mercy as to put it in the hall of fame, his beatitudes of the greatest things that he's after inside you and inside me. Here's the reason, I believe. It's because it is the heart of God himself at his very center of his character to be merciful. He loves mercy in himself to give it to other people and he wants that to be at the heart and the center of his kingdom and those who belong to it. It is what God loves the greatest. And Jesus Christ himself is the king of mercy. Amen? I mean, in him we saw the mercy of God, his heart to us, basically on parade. If you look at the Old Testament, that was like a preview of what was going to come. And a lot of people look at the Old Testament and you think God was angry there and he's just upset and he's irritable. And that's not true. Actually, he was very merciful then. Moses says in Deuteronomy 4 to the Israel, he says, When you all act corruptly and by doing what's evil in the sight of the Lord so as to provoke him to anger, such that he would utterly destroy you and cast you out of the land, if you will seek the Lord with all your heart, he will be found by you. And then he says, he'll spare you. For 
uh, for the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not fail you to destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers, which he swore to them. He's a merciful God. Always. He's never changed. You know, in the Old Testament, when they sinned against them, remember? And they, uh, God gave them into their hand to their enemies. They did much evil before the Lord. Whenever they cried to God, he saved them every time. Uh, when they turned and cried to the Lord, when they were under the power of their enemies, he heard from heaven, says Nehemiah, and many times delivered them according to his, what do you think the word is? Mercies. You know, even one time in the Bible, God says, I'm done. I've had it with you. You've sinned so many times and I keep saving you and you keep going after evil. I'm done. I'm done saving you. What happens? They sin. They fall into their enemies. They cry to the Lord and he comes and saves them again. He just can't help himself from delighting to save and show mercy. This is the heart of God. We've got to know it. And even when we sin, God's mercy is to not strike us right away. Therefore, the Lord waits to be gracious to you, says Isaiah. Therefore, he exalts himself to show mercy towards you. God always wants to save. I mean, he does also judge and destroy eventually, but his first heart is always mercy. Isn't this great to know? Even wicked king Manasseh, I mean, this guy was the worst. He, he took his own sons and he burned them in fire to Baal, to the devil. He sacrificed them to demons. He did the foulest things and defiled the temple in Jerusalem such that God eventually cast him out of Israel, dethroned him from the throne, and he was in prison in a foreign land. As soon as Manasseh humbles himself and remembers the Lord and repents, God rushes to him, runs to him, forgives him, restores him, and lifts him out of prison and sets him on the throne again. I mean, would you do that? We wouldn't do that, but God does because he's merciful. We've got to know that. This is at the heart of the Creator to show mercy. He loves it. And if we saw that in the Old Testament as a preview, in Jesus Christ in the New Testament, he is like parading it live through the streets. If you think of it, you know, Jesus is mighty against his foes. He's against evil. He's a great warrior. But look at how he deals with the woman that was caught in adultery. And she's guilty. She deserves death, according to the law, and justice demands it. And they bring and cast her down before Jesus. Could Jesus have destroyed her? Sure. And just had her killed. But we notice he runs, if you will, or stands between the murderous crowd and the woman to save her life. And he says, let him who is without sin among you be the first to the throw a stone at her. And they all went away because they were sinners. They recognized it. And Jesus was left all alone with the woman. He looks up and he says, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Um, um, no one, Lord. Neither do I condemn you. Go and don't sin again. Mercy! I mean, the woman was caught in adultery. He just quickly ran to forgive her. This is his go-to. This is his first heart, is always to save and not to destroy. Is it your heart as well? You know, God will judge sin. If a man doesn't repent, God will sharpen his sword. He's bent and strung his bow. He's prepared his deadly weapons. And if a man doesn't repent or shows no mercy, God will come on a day of the last day, especially to judge with great wrath. But his first go-to is always not to destroy, but to rescue and restore. Think about the prodigal son. I mean, this guy was terrible. As soon as he took one inch of a turn towards his father, his father ran towards him, restored him, and said, let's have a party. My son, he was lost. He's alive. He, he's, he's been found. Let's rejoice, and we'll forget all the past and have a great future. That is your God. I have declared to you today, mercy's at the very heart of the king. He wants it to be at the heart of his kingdom and at the heart of those who belong to his kingdom, which is you and me. Is mercy at your heart? Well, how can we show mercy to each other? 
Well, if you think of it, there are thousands of millions of ways you could do it, but here's a few for your refreshment. Number one, you could show mercy in little tiny ways. When I was preparing this message, wrestling with it this week, I was over in the fellowship hall at one point like, ah, I need your help, Lord. And I saw on the counter, don't you, by the way, I saw on the counter a little tiny sugar ant. And I thought, mm, little friend, you don't belong here. I could smash you right now. You don't belong in this kitchen. But as I thought of maybe eradicating the little guy, I thought of this word from Hosea. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, over, O Israel? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender, says the Lord. I won't execute my fierce anger. I will not destroy, for I am God and not man, the Holy One of Israel in your midst, O Israel. I have not come to destroy. So I thought, little friend, get out of here. Go tell your friends. Take it outside. Get out of the kitchen. Don't let Vivian find you here. And I spared the little guy. And you know what? That felt so good. You know, I, I cared for this little creature. You can show it in little ways. Let the creatures and the little things, the little things in life, feel your mercy. That delights the Lord. But second, you can go onto a much greater scale, practicing mercy with your fellow man. That's what God's most after. Cecile, I've got to bring you up again. I mean, if I think of mercy, she can't pass by a person on the street who's homeless and in need without stopping and giving some food and a few dollars. That is mercy. Or, I see you guys, you know, we all have troubles in life. I see each of you spending some time caring for the other person and listening. Tell me your problems. A listening ear is mercy to show that I care is mercy. And then also, especially to forgive. When someone hurts you and you could take vengeance and justice would allow it to say, hey, I let you go for free. That's to show mercy. You guys do this. So you can show this in these medium, great kind of ways to your fellow man. And uh, frankly, we've got everybody around us has troubles. I mean, we all have troubles. Everybody's in trouble. So you don't have to look far to show mercy. Just look around. It's around you. you can do it a thousand times a day. Everybody's in trouble. Show a mercy. But thirdly, you could show mercy in the greater super, like, Hall of Fame great ways. And I give as an example, I read this week of a woman whose teenage son was killed by another teenage young man. Shot and killed. This was her son, her only son, the love of her life, her everything, and this young man killed her son and took him away. Her first heart, her first thought inside was, this boy has to pay for destroying my son and taking him from me. Anger, wrath, malice, hatred, bitterness was in her heart. But as she considered this, she thought, but this teenage boy who killed my son, he is also a teenage boy and he's lost. And in a terrible situation. And so she chose rather to honor her son and Christ. She said, I'm going to go to him in the juvenile prison where he was. And she said, I forgive you for killing my own son. And then she befriended him and showed him grace. And when he got out of juvenile prison some years later, she invited him to come live right next to her in her apartment complex. And they became great friends. And they go around to the urban center where they live, preaching to other young men in violent situations about grace and forgiveness. And she said, I wear a locket, a necklace around my neck with two halves. One is for my son, whom I lost, and for my other son, who I have now gained. And she has them both in her heart as her sons. And the boy became a Christian. And they're saved. And see how when you show mercy in these great Hall of Fame kind of ways, it brings life and joy where once there was only death. This is the marvelous might of, mystery, of, 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 of mercy that you can have in your life. For if you don't show mercy... It only ends in death. 
There's nothing there but destruction. Therefore, Jesus encourages and warns us, show mercy, for with the judgment that you pronounce, you're going to be judged on the day when I come. The measure that you give to others is going to be the measure you get back from me. Don't, uh, he says, judge not lest you be judged. Don't condemn lest you be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Uh, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, I'll put into your lap. And then he says uh, in James, judgment will be without mercy to him who has shown no mercy. So woe to the world for holding grudges, for being cruel toward those in need, for not caring for your fellow man and seeking vengeance instead of mercy. For the Bible says, God says, but what will you do on the day of judgment in the storm which will come from afar? When I as king return to the earth, what will your vengeance get you then? So repent, for the day of the Lord is near. As destruction from the Almighty, it will come. To those who have no mercy, there shall be no mercy. But what is the good promise to those who have mercy in their hearts? Jesus says, rejoice. For judgment is without mercy to a most who has shown no mercy, yet watch this, mercy triumphs over judgment. In other words, that's going to be your victory. That's going to be your triumph. When I come as king to give the kingdom, I will give it you who have shown mercy to your fellow man. And on that day you will obtain mercy. You will see only, only, only the friendly side of God a smile in your direction, and a welcome home with joy to those who belong to my kingdom, to the merciful, says the Lord. So let's look at one more question then about this. How can we then be more merciful if, well, we're not so merciful? You know, we all have a sin nature. We all want to seek vengeance and not forgive. We can feel that in our hearts. Well, if you do, repent. God will restore you. But what we really need is a heart for mercy. And where do you get it? Answer, the gospel. It's how God has first forgiven you so that you can then forgive others. As God first loves you, you can then go love other people. As he first showed mercy to you, he says, now that will give you the gift to show mercy to others. Consider how he forgave you. I mean, if you go through your own sins, the foul stains, the dastardly deeds, the wicked things that we've all done. God calls to us and says, just return to me. Return to me, faithless Israel. I'm not going to look on you in anger, for I'm merciful, says the Lord. Just return to me, come to me, and I will take you, one from a city and two from the country, and I will bring you to Zion. And that's exactly what he's done for us in Christ, who said, come to me, all you who are laboring under your sins, I will refresh you, he says. And we know this, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever should believe on him would not perish, but have eternal life. And with that, eternal joys under the mercies and salvation and forgiveness of God. How has God first forgiven you? Well, he's given you for friendship, restoration, and joys, and remove your sins from you, to gift you an, also a new heart with that through the Savior. So, as he's first been merciful to you, think, how then can I be merciful to others in that same way that God has first been merciful to me? We love because he first loved us, and we show mercy because he first showed mercy to us. And Jesus says, be ye therefore merciful in the same way as your heavenly Father has been merciful to you. And Jesus cries out again, as our king, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy today, but especially also on the day when I come. And I will gift to you my kingdom with joys everlasting. So let's rejoice today in the great mercies of our God. For the steadfast love of the Lord it never ceases. His mercies, they never come to an end. They are new and fresh for you every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Amen.